Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in this afternoon. And uh, again, we uh, just like to let even our television audience understand, we've got folks here from North Carolina. And uh, Ed and Shirley are getting to be old hands. They're here from Minnesota. And uh, we've got some others that are visiting even from the Oklahoma area. We're just glad to see everybody in. And uh, for those of you out in television, we'd just like to welcome you uh, to a Bible study. We're not against any particular group. We don't attack anybody, and I don't promote any one group, but hopefully we just simply open the Scriptures and uh, let you see what the book really says. I, I had a call last night from someone from a group far, far different from what I've been raised in, but he said, Les, he said, I would like to disagree with you, but he said, it's in the book. So he says, how can I? And uh, hopefully that's what we plan to do, is just let people see what the Scripture says, not what some person thinks or says. Uh, again, we like to uh, remind folks that we are beginning in book number 49. So if you call with regard to today's program, just tell the girls that uh, you want either the tape or whatever of book 49. All right, we're in Hebrews chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 1. But uh, before we start in Hebrews chapter 5, again, I always like to kind of recap things that we've said several, several programs ago. And that is, the book of Hebrews is written primarily to Jews, of course. That's why it's called the letter to the Hebrews. But these were Jews who were on the fence. Uh, they had not just made that total break from Judaism, and so Paul here, who I feel is the author of the book of Hebrews, is trying or is attempting to convince these Jews to make that total break and put Judaism behind them with all their laws and rules and regulations and step out into this whole concept of grace by faith plus nothing. And as I said in some of our opening remarks back in chapter 1 and chapter 2, consequently you will not find the plan of salvation laid out in the book of Hebrews like it is, for example, in Romans or 1 Corinthians or Galatians. It is simply a book that is going to show that everything that was practiced back there under the law were just simply precursors to that where we are today. This whole concept of the gospel of grace didn't just come out of the woodwork. It was a progressive revelation. And uh, when Israel rejected the Messiah and God raised the Apostle Paul specifically then to go to the Gentile world with this tremendous gospel of grace without works and by faith alone. And you know, most of Christendom still rebels at that just as much as the Jews did here in the time of Paul writing to the Hebrews. So before we even look at Hebrews chapter 5, I'm going to use a verse that I use so often when I'm teaching in the Old Testament in our Oklahoma classes. And I'm going to take you back to Romans chapter 15 for just a moment before we start in Hebrews because this verse is just as appropriate for our study of the book of Hebrews as it is for our study of the Old Testament. Now, of course, when Paul wrote Romans, he was referring to the Old Testament writers, but since Hebrews is in that same vein, I'm going to use it for both directions. Hebrew, uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 4, where he writes, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, in other words, back in the Old Testament economy, they were written for our learning. See, not for our doctrine, not to find salvation, but these things were written aforetime for our learning, to give us basic understanding of, of the thoughts and the ways of God and how this has all progressed on up through human and biblical history to the time of where we are. All right, so these things were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures. Now that word scriptures means what? 
the whole Word of God. And now we can use it from cover to cover, and we can take comfort from them, and it's from the Scriptures then that we have hope for the future. Now, of course, we realize, especially since September 11th, we're living in tremendous times. We're living in, I think, the end time scenario. We're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Uh, to coin a phrase, we ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to get worse, and it's all leading up to, of course, the final seven years when God will finally pull the plug, so to speak, and His wrath will flow across the planet. But for now, you and I as believers take comfort from the Scriptures. We don't have to be alarmed by what's going on. My, I had the sweetest letter the other day. I read it to uh, one of my classes here in Oklahoma, where the gentleman recapped. He says, back on December 7, 1941, when I was a young lad of 19, he said, I was stricken with fear for myself and for my country. But he said, when September 11th struck, he said, no fear. Because he said, in the meantime, I have come to trust that Christ died for my sins. He was buried and rose from the dead. And now I have nothing to fear. Well, what a testimony, see? And that's where we as believers are in a unique position. The rest of the world may fear and tremble, but we can just simply uh, almost smugly say, well, we knew this was coming. We knew this was part of the picture. And uh, it just shows us that the end is getting closer and closer. All right, so we take comfort from not only the Old Testament now, but from all the scriptures. And so we approach the book of Hebrews in that same light. It's the Word of God. Even though it was directed to Hebrew people who were having a time separating from the old program, yet it is full of things that are appropriate for us today. And I trust that even in the previous programs, let's see, we started Hebrews in 46, wasn't it? So we've already completed two whole books just in the first few chapters. And hopefully in all those programs, we are just simply cementing the basis of our faith as believers. We started out, you remember, in chapter 1 and 2, establishing that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son. And as the Son, He was given intrinsic authority. And then as we've seen in chapter 3 and chapter 4, how that God detests unbelief. There is nothing... There is nothing that upsets God more than unbelief. Now, of course, God hates sin in all its forms, but unbelief is the top of the list. And we looked at that in chapters 3 and 4. Then in the last three verses of chapter 4, we, as I say so often, Paul just sort of shifts gears and he slips up into the approach of the high priesthood of Christ. And then in our last verse, as we closed our last program, we are now in a position as believers by faith in the finished work of the cross to come boldly into the throne room in our prayer time. We don't have to come with fear and trepidation. We don't have to come before Him wondering if we're good enough to be accepted, but rather we come boldly only because of what Christ has already done. All right, now as we slip into chapter 5, verse 1, we're going to start having a comparison then between the priesthood of Christ and the priesthood of Aaron and the Old Testament economy. Verse 1, chapter 5, For every high priest taken from among men, that is, from the nation of Israel, is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. Now, do you see the relationship there? The whole role of the priest was to present the needs of mankind to the holy God. All right, but now we got another point to make in, a, in another verse or two, so we'll put that on hold. But this human high priest, starting with Aaron, of course, came to God with things that pertained to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He had to take care of the sin problem. 
that man constantly was bugged with, and the high priest brought this before God. All right, now verse 2. This high priest of Israel, following in the line of Aaron then, was a man who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. In other words, there was no one too low on the totem pole for the high priest to be aware of and to present him before God. All right, and so them that are out of the way, for that he himself also, he was human, he was plagued with the same sins and temptations and passions as anybody else. All right, for he himself also is compassed or is encloaked or surrounded with infirmity. So just because he was the high priest, that did not mean that he was above reproach or above sin. All right, then verse 3 and so by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer, that is a sacrifice, for sin. All right, let's go back all the way, if you will, to Leviticus, because we always like to compare Scripture with Scripture, and I guess our letters are constantly reminding us of that, that they appreciate the fact that whatever we say, we back up with the scriptures. And so when you come back to Leviticus chapter 16, I'm thinking it is, it better be. Leviticus 16, we have the Day of Atonement when the high priest would go in behind the veil and sprinkle the blood on the Holy of Holies or the Ark of the Covenant. All right, and. Uh, Chapter 16, let's just jump in at verse 14. We haven't got time to read all these verses, but we'll just pick out the ones that pertain to establishing the fact that the high priest was just as much a sinner as the average Jew. All right, 16, verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat that is in behind the veil, and before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. <clears throat> now verse 15, Then shall he kill the gold of the silver that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the booklet, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before it. And here we find that he, uh, he makes the atonement for himself first and then for Israel. Now maybe I should back up a little further to... Uh, Verse 6 in this same chapter. Maybe I, I should have hit this first. Leviticus 16, verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering which is for himself. See that? And make an atonement for himself. Which tells us then that Aaron was just as much in need of a sinner's approach to God as the ordinary Jew. And then, of course, we drop down to verse 14. Then he was to take the second bullock and sprinkle that blood then for the sins of the people. All right, hope I made my point that the priesthood of Aaron was a human priesthood and they were just as much in need of, of uh, forgiveness and uh, the atonement of their sin as the ordinary Jew on the street. All right, come back then again to Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> and so not only was he human so that he could identify with the everyday experiences of the people, but also that he recognized that he was a sinner and was just as much in need of forgiveness as the ordinary Jew. All right, now then verse 4 of chapter 5. And no man, not even Aaron, no man taketh this honor, that is, to be the high priest. No man taketh this honor unto himself, <clears throat> but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Now, do you get the picture? Who commissioned Aaron to be the first high priest? 
God did. All right, let's go back again and look at the scriptures. Let's go back to Exodus 28 when we see the beginning of this whole system of religion, the building of the tabernacle and the establishing of the priesthood and the clothing that he would wear. This is all back here in Exodus. But let's just look for now at how that God commissioned Aaron to be the high priest. Moses didn't appoint him, nor anyone else, only God. All right, chapter 28 of Exodus and verse 1. Here's the instruction. And God says to Moses now, Take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother. No, you haven't all found it yet. I better wait a second. Exodus 28, <clears throat> verse 1. You know, our television audience waits until you found it because otherwise they haven't had time either. All right, so now 28 verse 1, God says to Moses, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Aaron Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's son. And then, of course, the rest of the chapter is covered with instructions for their clothing. Now then, on the other side of the coin, <clears throat> turn with me to number 16. And you all, tr I trust, know the strange fire of Korah. Number 16. <clears throat> Now, Korah was, of course, a member of the tribes of Israel. And he got a little arrogant and puffed up, and he just didn't feel that Moses and Aaron were the only fish in the pond. And so he took it upon himself to play the role of a priest. And so here in number 16, we find the account. Now, verse 1. Now, Korah, the, fun, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, so on and so forth. Verse 2, rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, you take too much upon you. See their arrogance? They're telling them Moses and Aaron, hey, you're, you're, you're trying to be the big wheel. We're going to have just as much part of this as you. And so they said, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore do you lift yourselves up above the congregation of the Lord? And when Moses heard that, what did he do? He fell on his face. And he thought, How could anyone be so brazen? Verse 5, And he spake unto Korah and all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him who hath chosen will he cause to come near. All right, now this Moses instruction to Korah and those that were following him. All right, this do. Take your censers, that is the fire, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. All right, verse 9. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle, and to stand before the congregation to minister well, anyway, I think you can know what happened. And you came all, you can come all the way down to verse 21. Next day comes around, and here comes Korah and these 250, and they're going to play the role of the high priests, you see. All right, and so you come all the way down to, uh, to verse uh, 20, 26. Or what did I say? 21, yeah, it didn't look right. 21, separate yourselves, Moses tells the people of Israel, separate yourselves from among this congregation that they may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their face and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be angry with all the congregation? 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rode up, rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. Well, anyway, you come on down. And now verse 28. Moses is going to give an example. And he said, Hereby shall you know that the Lord hath sent me himself to do these works, for I have not done them in my own mind. If these men die the common death, in other words, if they continue on living and die from whatever other reason, or if they be visited at the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But, Moses says, now take notice, if the Lord makes a new thing, and if the earth opens her mouth and swallows them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. All right, now then we come down to the confrontation. And uh, let's see. I want to be sure I don't skip something. Verse 31, And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking, all these words, that the ground clave or separated and sunder that was under them, that is under Korah and his followers, <clears throat> the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, in other words, those who had uh, connected themselves with him in his rebellion, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit that is into Sheol, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. That's how seriously God dealt with false priests. And so always remember that when God stipulated certain things, it was not to be taken lightly. You know, we saw in the book of Hebrews in uh, one of our earlier programs, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, Korah and his family found out. All right, <clears throat> now if you'll come back with me then to Hebrews again. So that Aaron was designated by God himself as the high priest and those that followed him. No man dared assume the role of a priest without God's commission. And that's why I wanted you to see for yourself the account of Korah. All right, now then we'll move on into the next verse. And now we move into the priesthood again of Christ himself. Now remember, the priesthood of Aaron were among men. They were human. They had the same failures, the same sinfulness as anyone else, but God had commissioned them. But this priest, Christ, is not of among men, but the priesthood is a follow-up of what Aaron began. So the, so the functions of the priesthood are relatively alike. But here we had a human priest, and here we have the Son of God. Verse 5, So also Christ glorified not himself. In other words, now here's where it gets ticklish, doesn't it? When we start dealing with the Trinity, the triune God, it is so hard for us to reckon the fact that on the one hand, Christ was totally human. On the other hand, he was totally God. And we have to take this by faith. All right, so now here we see Christ from his humanity, not demanding that he be made a priest, but rather what? God declaring that he's the priest, just like he did with Aaron. Okay, now look at this very carefully. So Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but the Father said, Thou art my Son. Today I have begotten thee. And I'll go on and read verse 6, and we'll come back. We have time and look at verse 5. As he saith also in another place, <clears throat> Thou art a priest forever. Now look, who's speaking it? God the Father. To whom? God the Son. And yet, 
we know that the Son is a part of the Godhead, the same as the Father. But here we're, we're separating him just like in his earthly ministry. In his earthly ministry, I think I pointed out a few programs back. Why does Jesus in especially John 17, why does he pray to the Father? Well, he's praying from his humanity. And then he can pray to the Father. On another instance, he can make the same statement as the Father. And so here's where we have to separate these things by, by a study of the Scripture and, and just simply take it by faith. It's beyond human comprehension. But nevertheless, here we find now then that God the Father designates to God the Son that He is to be the High Priest, not patterned after Aaron, but after Melchizedek. Now, I've only got two minutes left, and then I get in at a dilemma. I don't want to go where I can't continue, and I don't want to just fill up two minutes with fluff. But uh, I think we'll go back to Psalms chapter 2, where Paul is quoting. And uh, whatever time we have, we'll, we'll use up, and then we'll pick it up in our next program. Psalms chapter 2, where well, we have it. Word for word, as Paul is using it here in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. I, God says, will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son. So who's speaking to whom? Well, God the Father is speaking to God the Son. Thou art my Son. This day I have begotten thee. Now we have to be careful. When did David write the Psalms? Well, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1000 B.C. Was that when Christ was begotten, the only begotten Son of the Father? No. This is prophecy. See, this is something that's going to take place years and years out into the future. But here's the setting. God the Father hath spoken to the Son. And He says, This day I have begotten thee. Verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And so then you come all the way down through this chapter. It's a delegation of the authority that God imparts to the Son. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.